our spectacular campsites on the most remote of tracks to the workshop and everything in between. Your next episode of Great Off-Road Adventures is just seconds away. G'day everyone, it's Graham here from Great Off-Road Adventures. Um, we're just making our way out to a secret spot that I know of because due to popular demand, uh, I'm going to do a walk around video of the car. I've fielded heaps of questions uh, on modifications we've done to the car, how we use it to go camping and all that. So um, as a result, decided why not do a walk around of the car, cover off all the modifications, especially all the changes we've done to it after the last few years of camping and four wheel driving, where, you know, we've, we've used it fairly extensively and um, you know we've obviously worked out what works well what doesn't work so well what we need to update um, obviously everything we have updated to make it better more fit for purpose so about two years ago I did a modified video with Ronnie Dahl uh, it was modified episode 32 if I remember correctly and um, yeah we covered off all the modifications on the car but since then to now it's changed quite a lot, fairly extensively. So um, I figured it'd be as good a time as any to uh, obviously cover off what we've changed since then through to now and, um, and fill you all in. So we're nearly at my secret spot. Got a couple of little challenges to uh, get over to get there, a few little obstacles. And um, yeah, when we get there, we'll get stuck straight into it. guys we we're out here at my uh, favorite little filming spot and um, let's have a run through of the car so I think the best way to go about it is to go from front to back and we'll start on the outside first so uh, I'm gonna try and go into a little bit of detail uh, on a couple modifications but otherwise I'm just gonna skim over the top if you want to know more throw your comments in the comment section below and I'll go into the nitty-gritty detail in my replies to you so most prominent feature at the front of the car, TJM T13 bull bar. Uh, it's the deluxe, it's got the fog lights and all that. A uh, few reasons why I went for it. When I bought the car, I had a, an existing bull bar, it was alloy. Uh, it didn't, it was not aesthetically pleasing at all. It was like a big bulldozer blade. It had a shocking approach angle. And um, yeah, just didn't like the look of it. Hunted around, TJM had a big special come up. I liked the way in which the the uprights and the hoops around the headlights match the front of the vehicle. They match the shape. Aesthetically, it looks nice. And it's a full bumper replacement, so I didn't have to worry about the previous bull bar being a bumper cut and, you know, having had more bumper cut away than the new bull bar if I went with one that required a bumper cut and it being awkward and not matching. So TGM, full bumper replacement, bang, done, dusted. Uh, powder coat black because my rear wheel carrier that I had on the car at the time was well still have it is black so I wanted all the bar work to match and now as a result I'm quite liking the sort of black and grey stealth sort of theme that we got going obviously winch compatible uh, for us it, we're mad to do our trips without a winch uh, with one or two cars even the smaller groups that we go with with four or five cars um, 
it's really important to have a winch because it's just the slowest, safest way of conducting recoveries. And especially me, normally being the lead vehicle, uh, you know, it's really important to have a winch. So we're using a carbon winch, uh, carbon 12K. So 12,000 pound uh, winch, comes standard with Dyneema rope, a host of other features. Check out the website, there's heaps of information on it. It is a really, really nice winch. Um, for me, 12,000 pounds because cruise is big, it's heavy, you need that pulling power. Um, Factor 55 Pro Link on the front because it just neatens it up. We can wind it right up against the fair lead. It's neat and tidy and uh, it's all good. Going on to driving lights, we've got two X ray vision 220 series HIDs. Uh, both of these are pencil beam or spot beam, so lots of light, long distance. Uh, the factory headlights, I've got upgraded globes. Um, yep, so far so good. They, the factory headlights are pretty good. They do uh, a, a fair distance and a good bit of spread. So in that sort of combination, it's a pretty comfortable sort of lighting setup to use. The cream on top is um, the light bar. So I've got a Laser Lamps T24 Evolution light bar. It's bang on a meter long, fits across the front of the roof rack really nicely and um, it puts a heap of light out to that seven, 800 meter mark and it has a really, really good spread. It also, with the light coming from the roof rack, it fills in that depression and it gives you that depth perception that you lose with lights mounted to the front low down. So, super handy. Um, in terms of antennas, uh, I've got two on the front here. The small one is a mobile phone antenna. So it's a, RFI 6dB mobile phone antenna and the big one is an Oricom town and country antenna kit 7dB in this format big and tall can unscrew the top put a cap on turn it into a 3dB antenna It's also on a fold down bracket So if we're going down a tight track or if I need to go into the carport or an undercover car park something like that I can fold it down uh, Recovery points. I went with the ARB recovery points reason why um, they sit in a horizontal plane, not a vertical plane. So again, uh, it gives a better approach angle. They're also rated at 8,000 kilos a piece, opposed to 5,000 with a lot of the others on the market. And um, for price point, they're one of the best price points on the market. They're, I think when I bought mine, $85 a side. So yeah, pretty happy with that. Um, I'm using the Ironman 3mm bash plates. Uh, look, considering everything we've gone through, they've actually stood up really well. Uh, they've got dents, they've got paint missing, but they still bolt up. They can still get unbolted. We still service the car and all that. So uh, they've done their job, put it that way, because we've taken this car up through some fairly challenging obstacles and they've definitely done their job at protecting the car. Um, my only complaint is the front bash plate doesn't have any ventilation holes for the front diff, um, so any air ventilation. So it attributed to the issue that I had when we were going up to Karajini where um, the front diff got hot and because it was maybe a fractionally, fraction over full, it also pushed the oil out of the breather. So big V8, uh, 45 degree day, radiant heat from the engine, radiant heat from the bitumen, um, front diff being slightly over full, no airflow because of the bash plates, uh, it just pushed that oil out the breather. If you look at the front diff on a 200 series, it has fins and stuff on it, so obviously it's designed to have a little bit of airflow to help keep it cool. So uh, I'm looking at bash plate alternatives that are slightly stronger and have ventilation. Anyway, let's go to the side of the car now and uh, we'll talk about what's happening down there. All right, so on the side of the car, uh, we'll talk about the bar work. Um, I'm using the TJM T13 scrub rails and side steps. Uh, went with them because they tied in with the bull bar. There would be no compatibility issues. I wouldn't have to cut or try and bend them or anything. So that's the main reason I went with that. Plus they were on a ridiculous special at the same time as I got my bull bar. Um, I got my bull bar my scrub rails, my side steps for $2,200 or $2,300 and um, I, I fitted them all myself. So 
yeah, pricing was absolutely ridiculous. Safari snorkel, this was fitted to the vehicle when I bought it. It's the V-Spec. Um, it was put on the car before the R-Max and all that existed. Uh, and now looking at it, and you know, I've been thinking about it for a while. In a way, I'm quite pleased that I've got the V-Spec snorkel because uh, it's very narrow between the snorkel and this scrub rail. Like, I can't even get my pinky finger through that gap. Um, they do touch when we go off-road. There's just a very minor sort of witness mark on the inside of the scrub rail. There's just a little bit of paint missing. The actual structural integrity of the snorkel is fine. You can't even see on the snorkel where it's hitting. The guard is not bent or deformed or getting damaged at all. You can just hear the odd little tap tap when we hit a big, um, a big washout or corrugation or have a big impact where the body flexes against the chassis. They just touch. Let's talk about suspension. When I bought the car, it had 120,000 Ks on it. And the suspension that was in the car at the time was a Dobinson's kit. It had 100,000 Ks on it. It's a two inch kit. The shock absorbers needed replacing, but the springs were okay. So I replaced the shock absorbers with uh, Ironman Foam Cell Pro shocks. Um, run that set up with the Dobinson springs. Uh, I lifted it to two and a half inch at the front to take some of that nose down sort of look out of it. Um, we put upper control arms in it to correct the wheel alignment because we were going higher in the lift. And they definitely improved the drivability of the car, especially on the highway. It lost that sort of nervousness, twitchiness. So pretty happy with how they're going. Uh, and we've also got a diff drop kit in the front. So that's to lower the diff down, get the CV angles a bit more level for durability, strength, and longevity as well. And yeah, 240,000 Ks, factory CVs, it's all good. Rear suspension, again, Dobinson Springs, Ironman shocks. Uh, we've got Airbag Man airbags in the rear with the Kevlar sleeve. Uh, talking about rims and tires though, uh, big thank you to Integrity Tires for helping me out. Um, it was a lead up to the four wheel drive show. I wanted to change the look of the car a little bit. So one of the big reasons for doing this was obviously aesthetics. But believe it or not, there's actually some functionality to fitting the aftermarket rims. Um, the big one for me was the increasing the wheel track. So I've gone from the factory rim POS 60 offset to these um, Allied Stinger brush, which are a POS 35. Um, so we've gone 25 millimeters wider at each tire. So 50 millimeters wider in total in a wheel track. Uh, that's definitely increased the stability of the vehicle when we get onto side angles, but also at the rear, it's moved the rim because the inside rim, inside of the rim is cut on an angled profile. It's moved it just slightly further away from the brake caliper, and now we're no longer trapping rocks inside the, again, between the brake caliper and the rim, and that was a big issue that I had with the stock rims. So, yeah, a couple of reasons, obviously, for fitting the aftermarket rims for us. Obviously aesthetics, the stability, and obviously a little bit more clearance around my rear brake calipers. Um, the other reason was by bringing the offset out, it gave me more clearance to my front suspension components and allowed me to fit the bigger tires. So uh, I've gone and I've got the Toyo Open Country RTs. And again, like I said before, it's an aggressive all-terrain tire. Um, I was always gonna get an aggressive all-terrain tire for this car because we do a bit of everything. These things have received really good reviews in America. They haven't been out in Australia all that long. So um, I'm keen to put some kilometers on them and I'll do a good in-depth review in 10, 12 months time once I've run them for a couple, thousand, couple tens of thousand Ks. Um, that's pretty much it uh, on the side of the car. Let's, uh, let's move to the back now and we'll talk about the rear bar and that sort of thing. We've got the awning set up because it's um, pretty hot standing out in the sun. But uh, the rear of the car, because uh, we've lost a bit of space from the roof with the hard shell tent and all that, um, I wanted a way of carrying some stuff on my rear wheel carrier, sort of using it as a bit of storage. So the left wheel here, obviously Max Tracks on the Max Tracks wheel harness. They used to live on the roof rack, but couldn't now that I've got the tent, and they can't. So Max Tracks on the outside. On the inside, high lift jack, shovel, shovel holders custom made. Also have a 
old UHF antenna mount here. Now my UHF antenna's up on my um, awning, which I'll give you a close up look at. Uh, inside this wheel or on this wheel, there's not as much happening because it's under the awning. We don't want to have a heap of stuff here that then intrudes in our living area, our awning space. So we've got just a camp light, a work light, um, and a fire extinguisher. So that's pretty much that. As for what the rear bar is, it's actually um, an Ultimate four-wheel drive strong arm rear bar. So it was originally made by Ultimate four-wheel drive in Bibra Lake. Um, then I believe they sold the jig to another fabrication company in Perth. Um, they made the rear bars for a short period of time and they stopped making them. Bit of a shame, uh, I quite like it. It's definitely proven to be strong. Uh, the, de the departure angle on the 200s, are not, it's not great. Um, so by having the rear bar, obviously a bit of protection. It's had a few hits and it stood up to it. Underneath the rear bar, we've got uh, a 180 litre long range fuel tank. So between that and the original 93 litre fuel tank that's underneath on the driver's side, um, just in front of the rear diff, we've got 273 litres of fuel capacity. So that is heaps. We pretty much work on 1200 kilometres off road 1700 kilometers like combination around town 2000 kilometers on the highway so yeah with that fuel capacity uh it's absolutely awesome there's um there's not a lot of tracks out there that make us concerned about fuel so anyway that pretty much covers off the outside let's start at the front again and work our way through the interior all right so going through the interior our main navigation is done through a HEMA HN7, and we just have our phones and an iPad as a backup. I use the iPad for flying the drone and that sort of thing, so it has a couple purposes. In terms of driving the car, just near my right knee here, we've got my spotlights and light bar switches. They're switched independently. I've got the fuel gauge and the pump activation for the fuel tank. And I've also got my iDrive and my air compressor switch. Um, by my left knee, uh, I've got to reinstall my brake controller. I was doing a bit of tidying up with wiring and stuff, so that's out at the moment, but that's where it lives. You can still see the bracket there. And then I've got my lockup kit switch for my Richard's lockup kit. We'll talk about that when we talk about the engine bay. Down here though, we've got a dual EGT and boost gauge. It's a SAS gauge. Uh, got it because it was a budget conscious option. We just came back from Karajini. My other little EGT gauge had um, busted itself from the corrugation. So just wanted to get something in just to continue to be able to just reference what we were up to. To the left of it, scan gauge two, obviously can scan for fault codes, can also monitor via the diagnostics port, water temperature, transmission temperatures, um, fuel usage, voltage, plethora of other things. So that's pretty handy to have. To the left of that, mobile phone cradle, that's hooked into the mobile phone antenna. Gets me one or two extra bars of reception when we're out in the bush. Um, UHFs here, there's two of them. Quickly touch on why. Uh, the Uniden unit, it's a 7060. The main unit lives under my seat. It's all controlled by the handpiece. It goes to the antenna at the back on my awning. It's the sort of convoy radio that we talk to each other in when we're in convoy. Um, the second unit, is the Oricom, it goes to the bigger antenna at the front. When we're out in the bush, I'll set this up to scan. So um, we can hear if there's a distress call or if there's another group in the area, that sort of thing. When we're on the highway though, this is my preferred radio to use because it's actually one of the dual receive Oricom units. So you can monitor two channels at exactly the same time. And you can obviously talk on one and then with the push of one button, switch across, talk on the other. So rolling down the highway, for example, coming up to a heavy vehicle, switch across from the convoy channel to the heavy vehicle channel, push of one button, talk to the heavy vehicle. He says, yeah, it's all clear, bring it around. Cool. Go back to the convoy channel. Hey guys, yeah, I'm gonna overtake. He says, yeah, it's clear, send the second car and send the third car. Now, you wouldn't hear that if you didn't have a dual receive unit for starters, but I can swap back over at the push of one button to the other channel and acknowledge that and say, yeah, no worries, thanks mate, we'll do that. 
Go back to the Convoy channel, say to the guys on the Convoy channel that don't have dual receive units or two radios, yeah guys, bring around, it's all clear. You know, it works. Otherwise, if you were trying to do that on two separate channels, you'd have to put one handpiece down, grab the other one, talk. Uh, you can see it just becomes a juggling act and it's a real pain. So the dual receive functionality, being able to swap between the channels at the push of one button, awesome. The only other thing, in regards to communications that happens up the front here is in my center console. Um, I've got my spot GPS tracker. The only other thing I'd get in addition to this is uh, on the really remote trips, um, I'll hire or I'll borrow a satellite phone um, for two-way communications, effective two-way communications. Because this is great, I can call for help, but I can't actually tell the outside help what I need. Can't tell them if it's a mechanical issue or uh, if I've been bitten by a snake. So being able to call for help and then being able to actually tell the people that are coming to help me what's happening, that's the important bit. So that's the benefit for me in having a, a means of effective communication, whether that's VHF or HF or sat phone. There's plenty of options out there. I'm not gonna go into it now, but for me, I, I believe in a sat phone is the best way to go. Anyway, uh, let's move into the middle row of the car and we'll start getting into the storage compartments and how we use the car for camping. So as you can see, we're missing a couple seats here. Um, because it's only Jess and I that use the car when we go away camping, um, we decided to make this false floor and remove the rear seats. I still have them at home and I can still put them in when we need them, but um, for our big trips and when we're filming events, um, the ease of carrying stuff, we just, we use this false floor. So it's aluminium frame. Uh, I made it myself, sheeted it with 10 mil marine ply, put marine carpet on it, and it bolts into the existing seat mount. In the middle here, there's a fixed um, shelf. Well, this portion of it is fixed. That's designed to take the freezer and, um, or the second fridge, depending how we're running it. And uh, then we can reach it, or the passenger can reach it whilst we're driving and get a drink out, that sort of thing. Um, and then each side, that side and this side uh, opens up. And underneath here, we keep our water bladder, which is an 85 litre FlexiMake water bladder. Uh, originally got it to actually go between the seat backs and the cargo barrier and carry water in that otherwise useless space. So in that configuration with the seats in, we can take 60 litres of water. In this configuration, we can take the full 85 and there's still a bit of storage space behind the bladder. And um, like when we did a Karajini trip, uh, we didn't get to Exmouth for a week um, and we we're carrying all our snorkeling gear, we we're carrying a drinking water hose and all that stuff that we didn't really need until later on in the trip. So we put all that in this storage space underneath here. Uh, got a cargo barrier here. It's part of the Outback drawer system. Um, above the cargo barrier, I'm keeping my sand flag, recovery blanket, and some poles. On that side there, got a first aid kit. It's just pushed into the cargo barrier in the window. I can just pull it out if I need it. Um, but this side here is the main sort of electrical charging area of the car. So we've got our 600 watt inverter, our power board, all our battery chargers. So that all is for our production gear when we go away filming for great off-road. And then at the top, above all that, we've got our little um, projector 8 amp 240 volt charger. And so when I get home, uh, when I'm using the car daily, I can plug this lead in here. The car has a 240 volt circuit. So the charger comes on, the fridge goes on to 240 volts, and there's a plug unit and stuff at the back as well that goes on to 240 volts. So the auxiliary battery's charged, the fridge is run, and there's some, you know, it's a pretty handy setup. And we use that when we get to caravan parks and stuff as well. Um, or if uh, we're on a camping trip, we've got a base camp and one of our friends brings a generator, that sort of thing, we can hook in and, and use free power. Anyway, um, pretty much that covers the back here. Let's go to the um, cargo space at the back and talk about how we live out there. Well, as for living out the back of the car, 
this is uh, where it gets a bit more interesting and, and fun. So we can fit a Weber queue, plastic table, three boxes of foods, um, a couple buckets, and our camp chairs all in this area here. And that's all the stuff that we pretty much use each night for cooking and living at camp. In terms of the Outback drawer system that I've got here, the left hand side I've got the ARB compressor. Um, it's the twin motor compressor, it's got an air tank as well, that's all in the wing. Got the outlet here, switches up the front, so whilst I'm driving, I, I know that we're going to need to air up soon, I can just bang, hit the switch, compressor turns on, fills up the air tank, it's all ready, I can just plug a hose in and bang, 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 fill up the tyres, all done. On the face here, I've got my full battery monitor system. This also tells me how much power is going in and versus how much power is going out, so I've got 110 watt uh, slimline semi-flexible solar panel on the top of this tent and um, it just trickles in and keeps the fridge running and the battery charged during the day so um, when I park the car and stuff at work it does its job but uh, it's certainly not enough solar power to keep up with um, the gear that we've got to run when we're away on trips. Uh, in the left hand drawer here this is my tools drawer so socket sets um, tire repair kits, allen keys, spanners, pliers, um, tire pressure stuff, um, WD-40, tent pegs, hammers, you name it, it's all in there. Also got uh, spade connectors, electric connect connectors there. Um, right hand drawer is our kitchen drawer. Uh, above it this is a Dun & Watson tilting fridge slide and on it is a Waco CF50 single zone 50 litre fridge. Um, can also run it as a freezer but because you know this is our sort of living area we run this as a fridge. We run the one well, on our bigger trips in the middle um, row on the false floor shelf we run that as our freezer. Um, reasons why I went the tilt slide, the mechanism is only about 40 millimeters thick versus a drop slide that's about 70 or 80 millimeters thick. And seeing as storage is at a premium in the wagon, um, it was important to you know try and get as much storage space as possible. So that was the main reason. Plus, it's just it's got gas assist struts. It's one one motion instead of the old pull it out lower it down, you know, all that sort of mucking around you got to do with drop slide. It's also a bit lighter than a drop slide, so, you know, there's some weight savings to be had there as well. Um, to the right of the fridge, this is just a general storage area, dustpan and brush um, for, you know, dusting off our feet before we go to bed. Um, we've got our little 12 volt shower, some camp lights, washing up tub, floor mats, that sort of thing. Um, in this side wing section here are all the spares for the car, so you know belts, hoses, coolant, all of that. I'm not going to go into the spares because I'll cover that in another video and I know that I'll forget something, but that's all down there and in the jack compartment. Um, then in terms of the electrical stuff on this side here, this 240 volt um, plug, that comes live, it goes live when I plug the car in on 240 volt power. Um, I've obviously got 12 volt sockets. And then obviously the switches, and they turn on the 12 volt sockets, they turn on the camp light. So there's one on the tailgate up here, a couple on the roof rack, and then obviously the big one on the wheel carrier. Underneath here, this little battery monitor. Um, its sole purpose in life is to tell me what my inverter's doing when we're at camp. So we can be sitting here and I'll go, oh yeah, the inverter's charging a couple batteries and the laptop's running, I'm offloading some footage. How much power's it drawing? Oh, Right now it's drawing 2.4 amps, I'm charging some batteries, but you know with the laptop and all the stuff running, we can be drawing 10, 15 amps from that, then add on a fridge running, a um, couple camp lights in the evening, and we can be comfortably pulling from our auxiliary battery 15 to 20 amps an hour, which it's a 120 amp battery, so it's got 60 amps usable, we could kill that battery in three hours if we're not careful. I guess the last thing to touch on is these little um, storage compartments in the tailgate here. Originally, this is where the factory toolkit lived. Considering I've got a whole drawer full of tools, I didn't want the double ups and it's extra weight. 
So this is where I store all my utensils. So kitchen scissors, knife, forks, spoons, lighters, measuring cups, that sort of stuff in this side. And then in this side, spatulas, uh, tongs, you know, cooking equipment, cooking utensils. So that's the way that's all set up. Um, anyway, that pretty much covers off the inside of the car. Let's go and have a quick chat about uh, the engine bay, what modifications are happening there, and then we'll talk about the awning, the tent, and we'll wrap the video up. Well, there's a few things happening under the uh, bonnet, so we'll just start where I am, work our way around. Back corner here behind my factory fuel filter is my secondary fuel filter. So it's set up as a pre-filter, 30 micron fuel manager kit. Um, this is the setup that was recommended to me by two of my mechanics, both Mike at Henderson Mechanical and Mark at AMV. So this is the way that we went about setting it up. Uh, in the middle here, I needed a solution for my diff breathers. I had an air on board kit, but I didn't actually have anywhere to fit the little tab bracket thing. So I made my own. So I've just got a piece of aluminium angle here, drilled it out, cut it, um, just ground it back so there were no sharp um, corners or anything you cut yourself on and mounted the diff breathers there. So I got rear diff, the middle breather is transmission and transfer case because they T-piece and come up as a single unit from the transmission. And then um, the end here is my front diff. Uh, moving forwards, uh, we'll talk about battery capacity and the way that the auxiliary battery setup is. Uh, originally there was a third battery here when I bought the car. Now, for what we do, 80 amps just wasn't enough capacity. So I needed to get more battery capacity. For a very short period of time, I ran my auxiliary battery over that side and an 80 amp here in parallel. So I had 200 amp hours of capacity. That was awesome. Pretty much no power concerns. Problem being, the battery that sits here, it's not designed to have a battery here. So the fuel filter was pushed right back here. It was a real pain. And then with corrugations and using the car off-road, we pushed punch the captive nut out the top of the wheel arch here and we're cracking the inner guard. So we ripped the battery out, the battery tray out, welded up the inner guard. Captive nut doesn't do anything there, so we just left that. Um, and we reset everything, the fuel filter and stuff, how it was from factory. Um, decided to retain the split batteries, um, continue with the yellow top Optima, been very happy with that as a starting battery and then just went down to a single 120 amp hour auxiliary battery over that side. So it's a full river, 120 amp hour battery, and that's the biggest battery that you'll be able to fit in a 200 series engine bay. Um, if you can fit bigger, <laughs> let me know, but that's it. Um, in terms of charging it, I've got a projector DC-DC, sits between the grill and the radiator. It takes the alternator charge, it takes the solar charge, and puts it all into that battery. It does its thing, I don't have to worry about it, so it's all good. And then the last thing that's happening under the bonnet is um, my catch can. It's over the back there by the brake booster. That's a fairly new addition. I had a previous catch can, it sat behind the bull bar, but because it wasn't in the engine bay and it didn't have that engine bay heat, it got condensation. It suffered from condensation and it drove me around the wall. So. As um, soon as I had the space by pulling the battery out and resetting fuel filters, relocating my pre-filter, which was over there, to this side, tidying it all up, I've got a catch can kit that sits in the engine bay, and now I have no condensation issues. In terms of performance modifications, uh, at 150,000 Ks, we pulled the intake off and we cleaned it out, so that's 90,000 Ks ago. Same time we fitted the first catch can, obviously to stop that oil vapor going in there, stop the EGR build up. We also tuned the car at that point in time, so we, um, we played with the EGR cycle to prevent the soot build up. Uh, so the tune that I'm running was done by Mark Taylor at AMV Automotive and Performance. Uh, it is a really nice tune. We're running about 240 horsepower and 600 newton meters of torque. So 
that's up from 164 and 400. So she gets up and moves uh, for sure now. Same time, we're also running a remapped transmission file. So change the shift point slightly, definitely changes gears a lot quicker, um, bit more responsive and all that. So yeah, definitely worth doing in my opinion. Um, and then I'm running a lockup kit as well. So that's to help the transmission temperatures stay cool. So when we're on the beach in high range, we can put the lockup kit in and uh, you know, it keeps transmission temperatures down, that sort of thing. So yeah, all up um, performance mods on this car, absolutely awesome, would be one of my most favorite modifications I've done. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but um, I'm also running an SRW uh, intercooler screen. So it sits underneath the factory um, plastic cowl cover here, and um, it stops all the damage, all the bugs and bees and rocks and stuff damaging and clogging the intercooler core. So um, you'll have seen that I pulled that out and I checked it at Carrigini um, and I, I you know, had spin effects flowers and seeds and stuff all stuck in there and um, quickly you could just wash it out and brush it out and put it all back together and instead of having it all stuck in the intercooler. So uh, that is a pretty handy piece of kit if you're going to do remote traveling or you know you want to look after your car. Anyway, um, that pretty much is the engine bay. Uh, whoops, should cover off my exhaust before we leave the engine bay. I'm running a twin three inch to a single four inch Mantra exhaust with cats, uh, no muffler and a rear resonator. There's uh, no drone that I can uh, hear. Obviously uh, is nice and loud when we get into it, but it's also pretty sedate when you drive the car normally. So in terms of roof racks and awnings and tents and stuff, this is the bit of the car that obviously makes camping so comfortable and easy for Jess and I. Uh, we do a lot of camping each year, so we've obviously refined the setup. I know there's always changes and you know stuff evolves, stuff gets better, but as it sits right now, we're both really happy with it. Neither of us have any complaints or any changes we want to make. So in that regard, that's why I'll say it's it's close to perfect. Hard shell rooftop tent, it's a King's Quickie. Um, I did a massive big review on that a couple months back. My thoughts haven't changed at all, but I have had a lot of questions about how the tent stands up to water and rain. It's a hard shell roof, so the water just runs straight off. It can't pull on it like a canvas roof. And you need like driving rain coming in sideways for it to hit the, the walls, the canvas walls of the tent. And because they're vertical and there's a bit of tension on them with the gas struts, the rain just sort of hits it and falls off. So in terms of rain and that sort of stuff, no issues whatsoever. I'm not gonna go into the tent because we did cover it in the review, but um, I will touch on quickly why we went with the hard shell tent. We had an old fold over rooftop tent and um, I hated it. <laughs> it was a good tent as in it didn't leak and you know that sort of thing but i just hated having to set it up and pack it up all the time take the bedding out put the bedding in the back seat which took up space so we ended up selling that and we got a swag swag is great it's good for quick little weekend trips but we're coming to the same issue we've got to keep the bedding in the car somewhere so you know we've looked at that and gone well that takes up space, it gets dirty because there's other dirty stuff in the car. And then, you know, we've got to take it out of the car, it rubs on the outside of the car, that's dusty. What can we do about fixing that? Started looking at these hard shell tents, but I was really concerned that if I got a hard shell tent, I was gonna come across the same problems I had with the soft tent, that I'd hate it, I'd hate having to set it up and pack it up. Not the case because they are so quick and easy to set up. So. The hard shell tent for us, and I said it in the review, was a game changer. It has made camping so much easier. It's four buckles, the tent's set up, bedding's in it already, bedding stays in it. So the bedding's not in the back seat of the car taking up space. So you consider all that. Uh, it really has made camping so much easier for us. Um, the only con for me is I can't fit into the carport with the tent on the top, but I've got side access at our new house now, so I just park it out there. And this way now I can fit bigger tires and you know all that. So yeah, meh, so be it. Um, awning, again, it follows that same 
Uh, it's that same principle of keeping it quick and easy. If you do a lot of traveling like Jess and I and Kieran and Eva, and we stop for lunch somewhere, you know, we might stop at a, at a place like this where, you know, there's a tree, but there's still not a great deal of shade. We want a bit of shade to prepare our lunch. Well, 30 seconds, I can have the awning out. We've got coverage over the tailgate where we prepare our food, where we live. It's just super easy. Wraparound awnings, super quick and easy to set up, provided you get the right one. Um, they all pretty much work on the same principle of having a big hinge at the back. Um, but some of them are not self-supporting, some of them are. So the reason why I got this one is in still conditions like we have today, uh, it's, it's entirely self-supporting. I don't have to worry about putting poles out. If it gets windy or, you know, uh, it is windy and we just want a bit of protection or we worry about the awning, the poles are stored in the actual cross, cross arms. And bang, simple done. There's holes in the foot, so we can just peg that in and that locks the whole awning down so it can't go anywhere. So yeah, definitely, definitely like the Easy On Batwing 270 degree awning. It is, um, it is nice and quick to set up, super strong. I think I brought three things across from my Ford Ranger with me. Four things, sorry. Um, my two-way radio, my scan gauge, my fridge, and my awning. They're the four things that I kept from my old car when I got the 200 series. So, yeah, this thing's been around a while, um, and I want it to last. It is lasting, and I want it to hang around a lot longer because it's a great awning. Um, obviously, the big pros with the 270-degree awnings are the space and the speed in which they set up. So they set up super quick, they pack up super quick, and it gives us like two, li two, two living areas, two bits of space. We've got the bit under the tailgate for preparing food and, and cooking and that sort of thing. And, and then we've got the space down the side of the car here where we can set up table chairs and actually, you know, like live, relax, look at the view, that sort of thing. So yeah, definitely big pros to the 270 degree awnings. Um, so yeah, between the, the awning and the tent, when we get to camp, it's super quick and easy to set up, um, which means it's not a chore, which means you'll do it and you'll enjoy it. So then you've got shade. Uh, if it's raining, you've got protection from the rain. Because the stuff's quick and easy to set up, you use it. And because you use it, it just makes your camping experience that bit more comfortable. So anyway, that's my two cents on it all. I think I've gone through everything on the car. We've done the outside, we've done the inside, we've done the engine, we've talked about the awnings and the roof racks and the tents. Uh, quickly with my roof rack, um, it's a Tracklander alloy flat rack, so it's 1800 by 1250. Uh, I've had this roof rack from when I first got the 200. For a very small period of time there, I had a custom made roof rack with the King's rooftop tent. That was when we are at our old house, so that I could actually fit in the carport. Now we've moved to the new house, even with that roof rack, I won't fit in the carport. So we've got the side access so I can park out there. So I went back to the Tracklander roof rack because it's a bit stronger and it's a bit easier to mount accessories and stuff too. So that's why we've got it on again. There is so much happening on my car, it's not funny. Yeah, we, we use it a lot so I can justify having it all. But you know, for someone that, doesn't use the car as often as us, it's probably a bit of overkill, but anyway, that's for you to work out. You've got to work out how much camping you do, how comfortable you want to be when you go camping, and how, so how much you're going to modify your car. Obviously, some of the modifications we've done to the car is for capability, but we go off-road to go to remote places, to go to amazing sites, um, and go to nice campsites, and explore areas that you can't get to that are outside of the reach of the normal person. So that's where camping gear comes in. So anyway, guys, uh, I could wrap it on for hours, but I won't. If you've enjoyed watching this video, subscribe to my channel on the link just here. And go and check out all my other videos. There's heaps there. Um, if you've got any questions about the car, throw them in the comments below and I'll reply to them with as much detail as I possibly can. Remember guys, happy, safe adventuring. Hopefully we'll see you out on the tracks and trails. If not, we'll see you in the next video. 
See ya.